Hi everybody, we just started to uh, record this meeting. My name is Ute Ritz Deutsch and uh, Wales Brown is uh, one of the coordinators of the local Ithaca chapter of Amnesty International. We, um, we co-coordinate, <laughs> we both coordinate the Ithaca chapter. So uh, today's event is about uh, BIN Books Week and uh, more broadly activism. So we will have several people reading, we'll have some musical interludes. And uh, thank you everybody for coming. And uh, Wales, I will give it to you. All right, this is Amnesty International Group 73's celebration of Banned Books Week. Um, Amnesty did not start Banned Books Week, the American Library Association did, and we'll be hearing a bit more about that from a genuine librarian in a few minutes, Kathy Michael from Ithaca College. But it's something that Amnesty was very happy to join in with because Amnesty has a long history of defending, uh, it's called persons at risk. And many of the persons at risk we've been defending are writers who have gotten into trouble for their writings or journalists who have gotten into trouble for their reporting or gotten into trouble because somebody thinks they might report or poets uh, who write poems about things that the authorities don't want poems written about, or uh, write verses that seem disrespectful of one or another existing authority. Um, now, Uta, you have a poem to begin I with. Do. You are the first reader right. among us, and then we'll go to Kathy Michael, the librarian. Okay, so it is uh, from this book, it is three question mark stories about human rights. Uh, Amnesty International uh, published it in 2010. So this particular poem is called Searching for a Two-Way Street. And uh, it is written by Mallory Blackman. Before I was born, grown-ups were passports and driving licenses and bank accounts and utility bills. Communication was mobile phones and cyber chats and sign language and face to face. But people were hello and hugs and pleased to meet you and how are you? Songs were talk to me, see my side, be with me, love me. And all those things were proof of a person's identity. All those things said, I'm here, I'm now, I'm ready, willing and able to communicate. But that was before I was born. Before I was born, there weren't cameras and scanners and microchip readers on every roof, on every street corner. Before I was born, school wasn't just a screen and a virtual teacher. Friends across the world had real faces, not faces chosen in games from a menu. We were more than just serial numbers and chips with everything. Before I was born, there was such a thing as secrecy, mystery, privacy, before I was born. Not anymore. Before I was born, a microchip was implanted at the base of my skull. No microchip, no state benefits, no health care, no travel, no food aid, no water deliveries, no shelter, no, no existence. No microchip equals no anything, nothing no thing, not a thing. So my mom and dad agreed when I was born to my microchip implant. We want our son to survive in this world. So yes to the chip. Mom and dad didn't like it. They didn't want it. But they had no choice. And the government now knows where I'm at at all times, where any of us, each of us are at all times. And we let them do that to us. The government said, Law-abiding citizens have nothing to fear. The government said, those with nothing to hide have nothing to fear. The curtailment of a personal freedom or two is a small price to pay if we wish to have nothing to fear, the government said. Those were the reasons we gave up our mystery. Better not to question, better not to know, 
better to accept. And our information is fed back to computers, state-of-the-art recording devices that sit in silence and capture all movements, all meetings, all positions. And mom told me, 30 years ago, this would have been inconceivable. And dad said, 20 years ago, this would have been unthinkable. Information shouldn't be. A one-way street, said mom. Who watches the watchmen, said dad. But they whisper the words behind closed doors. It doesn't pay to stand and say how you feel. Not yesterday, not today, not tomorrow. These days are over, mom and dad sigh. There's a rumor going around. True or not, who can say? What I think, true. The micro And this rumor, the microchips in our heads, at the base of our brains, relay our thinking, maybe even control our thinking. Just a rumor, but it smokes. So where's the fire, inside or outside our heads? There's a rumor going around that full thoughts, whole sentences can be tracked, traced, monitored. So I tried to think in short, sharp bursts. My best friend, Denny, told me, staccato thoughts come across like static, like noise. No rhyme, no reason, no sense, nonsense, true or not. Who can say? But now I think in bursts like bullets fired from a gun, proper sentences could make me disappear. Thoughts ought to be private, information ought to be shared. Communication should be a two-way street, an optional road to travel, but a road we all can take nonetheless. Those days are over, mom and dad murmur. But I'm not prepared to believe that. There has to be a way, some way, to make my life my own again, some way. So I've started looking for me in some manner to make my life a two-way street. And I will find it, because I'm not alone. In thinking in bursts like bullets fired from a gun, I'm not alone, because you are here sharing these thoughts. And I hope you think the same, feel the same. Our two-way street, we shall find, we shall explore, we shall travel together. The end. Can you say just something about the poet who wrote that? Um, I don't know about the poet, but um, this book is organized by um, the articles in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So Article 19, they have a little rephrasing of that at the end of the poem. We all have the right to make up our own minds, to think what we like, to say what we think, and to share our ideas with other people wherever they live, through books, radio, television, and in other ways which is why I thought that um, it made a lot of sense to start off today with this poem. Yes, indeed. I'm glad to hear the reference to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That, that is sort of the bedrock document of Amnesty International. It's 30 articles telling rights everyone should have anywhere in the world. And Article 19 is indeed about the right to transmit and receive information and hold opinions. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, okay. Can we bring in Kathy Michael from Ithaca College? Uh, thoughts of a librarian plus a reading of a favorite poet. Thanks for having me. Um, I'll just read a general statement about banned books and then a couple short poems. As a librarian, I'm pleased to be invited to this event celebrating Banned Books Week. Library workers have been at the forefront of fighting book censorship and we commend everyone for taking a stand against censorship. When we take a, take a stand for the band, as it sometimes says, said, we promote the value of intellectual freedom on college campuses, sometimes we call that academic freedom. And we support the freedom to seek, to read, to express ideas, um, even those that some consider unorthodox or unpopular. Ban Books Week, which falls in late September, is the National Book Community's annual celebration of the freedom to read. This event was launched in 1982 
in response to a sudden surge in a number of challenges of books in schools, bookstores, and libraries. The Banned Books Week Coalition brings together the entire book community, librarians, booksellers, publishers, journalists, teachers, and readers of all types to bring attention to book censorship. We distinguish between books that are challenged from those that are banned. A challenge to a book is an attempt to remove or restrict materials based on an objection from a per person or a group. A ban is the actual removal of the material. So I imagine some of the things we might hear tonight may have been challenged, but not, not necessarily banned. Um, I like poetry and I love that, that poem. Thank you for reading it to, to kick off the event. Um, but I'll read a couple from a fairly well-known poet called Shel Silverstein. When I was in middle school, I would read his, his poems and it sparked my love of poetry through his humor and through his drawings. And there's two poems. One was Little Abigail and the Beautiful Pony. And it was objected to because it discusses child death. And the other poem is called Ladies First. And it talks about cannibalism. So I guess on those two objections. And I checked my book out of uh, Ithaca College Library where I've been working since 2005. And maybe I will show because he, he does have a artistic flair in addition to uh, his poetry, they kind of go hand in hand. So Little Abigail and the Beautiful Poem, Pony, excuse me, it's a beautiful poem too. There was a girl named Abigail who was taking a drive through the country with her parents when she spied a beautiful sad eyed gray and white pony and next to it was a sign that said, for sale, cheap. Oh, said Abigail, may I have that pony? May I please? And her parents said, no, you may not. And Abigail said, oh, but I must have that pony. And her parents said, well, you can't have that pony, but you can have a nice butter pecan ice cream cone when we get home. And Abigail said, I don't want a butter pecan ice cream cone. I want that pony. I must have that pony. And her parents said, be quiet and stop nagging. You're not getting that pony. And Abigail began to cry and said, if I don't get that pony, I'll die. And her parents said, you won't die. No child has ever died from not getting a pony. And Abigail felt so bad that when they got home, she went to bed and she couldn't eat and she couldn't sleep. Her heart was broken and she did die all because of the pony that her parents wouldn't buy. And then in parentheses, he puts, this is a good story to reach your folks when they won't buy you something that you want. So little Abigail and the beautiful pony. And then the second one is called Ladies First. And we see a picture of Pamela Purse. Let's see if I can hold that up for a couple of seconds. And a cannibal on the right-hand side of the page. Pamela Purse yelled, ladies first, pushing in front of the ice cream line. Pamela Purse yelled, ladies first grabbing the ketchup at dinner time, Climbing on the morning bus, she'd shove right by all of us. And there'd be a tiff or fight or fuss when Pamela Purse yelled, ladies first. Pamela Purse screamed, ladies first, when we all went off on our jungle trip. Pamela Purse said her thirst was worst and guzzled our water every sip. And when we got grabbed by that wild savage band who tied us together and made us all stand, in a long line in front of the king of the land, a cannibal known as Fryam Up Dan, who sat on his throne in a bib so grand, with a lick in his lips and a fork in his hand, as he tried to decide who'd be first in the pan, from the back of the line, and the shrill voice of hers, Pamela Purse yelled, ladies first, <laughs> and that's it. So a little bit of humor uh, for the evening from Shel Silverstein, thank you very much. Thank you, one of my favorite old authors. When I was, I guess, a bit older than you at the time. But um, okay, we now have a video which Ute is putting up uh, by Mukadas Nijit, a video dedicated to the Uyghur poet Perhat Tursun. 
And Ute, you can say well, something about how we came to have this video and, and then share your screen and show it. Yes, so uh, we have um, an introduction by uh, Josh, um, who works at Princeton, and actually he also introduces the poem, and uh, some of the translation are from him uh, as well. Eratosun is one of the most famous novelists and poets in the Uyghur language, but a lot of his most interesting work has never been published in his homeland. A combination of censorship by the Chinese state and a relatively conservative Uyghur literary scene for many years made it difficult for Perat to publish his more avant-garde poetry and journals in the Uyghur region. A dozen years ago or so, when I was first reading and translating Peratosun's poetry, I asked him why I wasn't able to find more of his avant-garde work in journals, and he explained the situation to me. But he said he had a notebook at home with a lot of the poetry that he'd been unable to publish over the years, and he said he'd bring it next time we met. And the next time we met, he forgot the notebook. And he forgot at the time after that as well, and that repeated a few times. But then he finally remembered to bring it, and he told me he'd found it um, wedged behind a desk in his house, uh, where it must have fallen some time before. It was a dusty old notebook with its pages falling out. I took it home, and it was filled with remarkable poetry. Um, one of those poems was Morning Feeling. It began to Addiyen tuyğusi, pərhat dursun. Hər günə addiyen. Eski tüski tər gücündən qopal və səd avazı. Şişiklərinin qıslaçları cəmək. Dərizinin qıslaçları cəmək. Bar küçü bilən qərər öyqə sıxdılıb. İçin işlik əməz tür bəlkin bu avası, bıraq qopal və əsətli edin. İçin işlik alınıdır şü qədər. Yitər yadım qar. Nurğun cəylərdə Kent qalğını adırsın və Tutqun numarımdan İddər yadım o Nurğun cəylərdə Qib qalğını ni adırsın və Tilfun numarımdan Şunun qədən iz qılmən Yuqat qəndək Nurğun nərsini Yuqat qəndək Nurğun nərsini Yuqat qandək sizim ən hətta ən mühim içki sərlərimdir. Ən mühim içki sərlərimdir. Çoğun koçularda xeyb yalama iç istilir mən üzüm. Çoğun koçularda Qib yalanga çiz qılmən özümdir. Çünki hiç kim gəlməyi istəb, hiç kim mənə vurmaz telefon. Hiç kim mənə vurmaz telefon. Bəlkim ular oğurluqca nələdədir küzü tərmini. Nələdədir küzü tərmini. 
numusuzlar çıkılar tam aşak. Telefon numur ve adır simli. Tam aşak kılğandı. Resvalar çıksırlarım. Resvalar çıksırlarım ne? Sırtka çıkışkı peton almasın. Sırtka çıkışkı peton almasın. Emmini tımlayım ben bunda oturup. Eski terek için ansat ve bu o havazi. Eski tüskü terek için ansat ve bu o havazi. Yotkandın kütülgen abdam çelmesi. Yotkandın kütülgen tennum. Bet bu yıl bu yıl. Tan atkını ne itiraf kılış kıstar kişi. Tan atkını ne itiraf kılış kıstar kişi. All right, I will stop it here, but that was uh, Joshua Freeman, a colleague of um, Magnus Fiskus here from Cornell University, who um, brought us this uh, clip. So, but uh, I, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Well, let's say I appreciated it. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's not exactly an enjoyable situation for poetry there. Very true. Now, while um, uh, we were showing the clip, uh, Michael Andrews joined us. He is um, uh, Amnesty International Area Coordinator in uh, Florida. And uh, also, you've been organizing up north uh, this, this past summer. So, uh, Andrew, we will give you the floor. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. and. Uh, what I just saw was so moving, so thank you for showing that. Um, I, uh, I live in Miami Beach and am the area coordinator for South Florida, but I also live in Wisconsin in the summer and have a chamber music festival there. And um, a couple of years ago, a, a woman attended and she said, oh, I'd like to start an amnesty group. I said, great. So um, they had an event in September there's an art, a big art festival called Birds and Art in Wausau, Wisconsin, and they had an outdoor table. So um, I'm, it's sort of my baby group in Wisconsin. So I'm sort of an area coordinator for Wisconsin and Florida. Um, but I also play the cello and you asked me to be here for that. And yes. I think last time I played, I played the, the prelude of the first box suite. I don't remember, but what I'd like to do if you're ready for me is to play the second movement. and. For those of you that don't know, uh, Johann Sebastian Bach uh, was German. Uh, for string players, he's the most special, brilliant composer in the whole world. And he wrote lots of partitas and sonatas for violin, um, but he wrote six cello suites. And this is the first suite. And um, the, the format is it's always a prelude and then dance suites. And this is the Alemann, which is it's a German dance. 
Thank you, and thank the memory of Johann Sebastian Bach. So after Michael Andrews and, and the cello solo, we want to introduce Hilary Wynn, who's been sitting in on our Ithaca amnesty meetings from Boston, not quite as far away as Michael. Um, Hilary, do you want to say just two words about yourself 
And then I know you have some prose and a bit of poetry to read to us. Yes, thank you, Wills. Um, so I am Hillary, and I recently joined the um, Amnesty International's Ithaca chapter um, with Wills and Ute and a few other people. Um, and I know David's here today, too. Uh, so today I'll be reading select excerpts from Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye, and I chose this piece for numerous reasons. One, because Toni Morrison is one of the most distinct voices of modern literature, and I really think that her voice is one that we need to hear today. And also The Bluest Eye is about identity and, and shame and belonging, and it covers a range of controversial topics like child molestation, rape, incest, racism, which has subjected it to numerous attempts at banning the book in schools and um, at li in libraries. And um, because of COVID and so many other things going on in the world today, uh, women and children are, or a lot of women and children are tra trapped in this today. So I will start with this passage. This passage is about identity and cultural religion. All of our waste we dumped, we dumped on her, which she absorbed. All of our beauty, which was hers first and which she gave to us. All of us, all who knew her, felt her wholesome, felt so wholesome after we cleaned ourselves on her. We were so beautiful when we stood astride her ugliness. Her simplicity decorated us. Her guilt sanctified us. Her pain made us glow with health. Her, awkward, her awkwardness made us think we had a sense of humor. Her inarticulateness made, me, made us believe we were eloquent. Her poverty kept us generous. Even her waking dreams we used to silence our own nightmares. And she led us and thereby deserved our contempt. We honed our egos on her, padded our characters with her, frail, with her frailty, and yawned in the fantasy of our strength. And to sum this up, I wanted to read a short poem prepared by yours truly about children and political religion. And this is called Why. Why? I can never understand why. Why we dress our children up as flags to wave them around in parades. Why we teach them that freedom is the wind against their faces as we attach poles to their spines and call it strength. And still you ask why. They become too proud to kneel, yet so used to bowing. Their heads bent, bodies stretched in the name of freedom as we the people exercise their rights. Why do we create floating bodies of our wars and crimes? Why must we trade miracles for pennies and dimes? Why is this what we stand for? Is this what you stand for? Because how could I stand if only as tall as the poles built before me? No, I will not teach my children to fly only to watch you fly them as kites. You can sell their freedom, you can detach their spines, but I will cut your strings in poems and in rhymes. Still, I can never understand and will never understand for the life of me why it's so hard to let us be our own version of free. And that was that beautiful. Was Thank you so much. It's especially that, that last sentence, you know. Yeah, very beautiful. Thank you so much for that reading. Uh, now the turn of Jim McDonald from Chicago, who will read from a Sri Lankan poet and explain the predicament that he is in. So Jim McDonald, go ahead. Everyone else, please mute. Thanks, Wales. Thanks, Uta. Uh, I'm going to read a poem by the Sri Lankan poet Anaf Jazim. He is one of the six featured cases in this year's Ban Books Week action that Amnesty International USA is doing. He is a poet and teacher who has been arbitrarily detained in Sri Lanka for over a year. He is from the Muslim minority and writes in the Tamil language. He is, was arrested on May 16th, 2020 in, in connection with a collection of his poetry called Navarasam, uh, which the authorities claim promotes extremist ideology. Amnesty has reviewed the poems, and we do don't, and we don't think they do. And Anaf and his lawyer flatly reject any claims of extremism in his works. Uh, he continues to be 
detained without any evidence being produced against him. Uh, he's not been given unrestricted access to his family or to his lawyer. And he's being held in squalid conditions which have adversely affected his health. Since the authorities have not produced any evidence to substantiate any charges against him, we are calling for his release. One of his poems is called God's Doing Ama. And I should mention Ama is Tamil for mother. And this is that poem. The mango ripening, the people tree thriving, the cow laboring, the forest flourishing is God's doing, Ama. The fly flying, you dying, fire sparking, abhorrence forgetting is God's doing, Ama. The king overturned, the woman blossoming, leaving flowers to dry, stirring taste on the tongue is God's doing, Ama. The mango tree that gave fruit yesterday an aging mango tree today. Will it bear fruit tomorrow or will it fall today? Can we think these things? They are all God's doing, Amma. The price of milk powder rises. The children's souls are tested in suffering. But can we sigh? It is all in vain. It is all God's doing, Amma. The creator will form a path, Amma. How many have built houses with towers and forts as the country, the army, the retinue, the procession accompanied them? For all of them, a thousand townspeople came along, came seeking to measure four feet by seven feet and dig them a grave, Amma. What does it matter if you wear a silk sari, if you travel in a procession with pair eye drums drumming? Tabor's thundering. The date marked by God arrives no matter what. The body lifted to the hearse must go to the abyss. What if tears flow like the sea? What if you turn to rock? The body that has gone to the tomb does not sprout as patty. Where is Mahakavi Parati, Ama? Where is the great hero Castro? Ama, where is the pearl of wise men, Abdul Kalam, Ama? Where is the Hitler that obsessed us, Ama? Where are all the saints that were born on this earth, Ama? Never mind, you who were here yesterday, where have you gone today, Ama? Thank you. Thank you for this reading, Jim. Another powerful poem and, and interesting how easily the authorities get scared. You know, we would not think this to be a particularly controversial use of words, but yeah, how easily they are threatened. So, so thank you for that introduction and thank you for your reading. Our next uh, reader is Andy Doyle from the Ithaca Amnesty Group. Uh, um, I'm going to read poems by Marjorie Agosin, and I hope begin by telling us a bit about Marjorie Agosin. Marjorie Agosin, she's a, a Chilean writer, Chilean American. She it's called Dear Anne Frank, and I notice other people have read from her for Band Books Week. Marjorie Agustin grew up in Chile till she was 18, and then her family left because of the coup, you know, the, the other 911 in 1973. The army just took over, and uh, most of the officers, even the chief of police, was uh, were trained in the American School of the Americas. And uh, same with Argentina, too. Argentina and uh, Chile both had a experience of having the military take over the people and round up people and just systematically torture them and kill them. But anyway, we'll go back to Europe for a second. On Frank, the way Marjorie finds beauty in the tragedy of Anne Frank, she finds in her questions, I'll just start reading it. It is raining in Europe, Anne Frank, behind the threshold of timeless walls, 
dark rings have formed under your night-filled gaze. It's pouring rain, Anne Frank, and you can't splash around in puddles of shipwrecked and delirious Amsterdam. You can't kiss a single soul out in the rain or in its dangerous passageways. You can't tell a soul that a 13-year-old girl ought to be out making gifts of water in the rain, getting your fill of blessed water. You, Anne Frank, could only watch it raining from your cage. A couple more I like about, uh, no one will see your organdy or cotton dresses. Your mother will not dream of seeing you in your fine lace dress, flowing gently to the measure of your dancing feet. Now no one will buy your embroidered dresses, nor will palms burn with desire like festive palaces when they see you pass by. You are wearing death's clothes, so naked under the rains. And here's one on her death. On the threshold of night when darkness is no longer luminous, you, Anne Frank, curled up with death, you envisioned it next to your mutilated arms, felt its sinister heart beating next to the golden roundness of your ear. Anne Frank, when you were just 13, you knew death was stalking you. You were attentive to its signs, your fists banging on the shadowy doors. And um, Anne Frank, you wanted to paint stars, mushrooms, skulls, butterflies, amber, songs of light. Anne Frank, you wanted to be the green of the forest, the chloroform of wondrous stories. Anne Frank, you did not want to be gagged, only to paint stars. And just for one, the last one. While I read a poem, the tombs fill with bats and captive birds. A girl moans in the fabled arms of a delirious mother because she is hungry, she is cold, because her poverty has nothing to do with the poem's undulating rhythms. When I read a poem, men at war take out their Bibles, unleashing wrath's ominous signs, and the sad somber air leaves red trails in the streams. While I read a poem, there is someone who loves another in the most natural nakedness of the air. They recite verses and kiss each other. Poetry is a lover's body full of the bittersweet breath of love. When I read a poem, they torture a man, a woman. Okay, that's a, a beautiful book. It's um, very moving, Anne Frank. Uh, Dear Anne Frank, it's called. So yeah, Marjorie Agosin is still a writer. She's very prolific. She's put out about 80 books and she, um, teaches at Wellesley near Boston. And uh, she, I just like her. I, I came to her, I was just leafing through books in the library and I read uh, this one verse that said, I'm a friend of beggar women. Oh, I'm an enemy of the military and a friend of beggar women. And I thought, wow, I'm an enemy of the military and a friend of beggar women. <laughs> and so I've loved her poems ever since. I've just been reading the circle about the madres of the Plaza del Maya, de Maya in mm -hmm. um, Argentina, how these women marched with their lost children around the square. And they still did. They did it for years, 30 years or more. They did more good. I think they moved history more than the generals. Um, this is called the circles of madness because at times, uh, you know, they were called mad women and all. And I just want to read a few poems from that. So here they are. Have you seen my son? She asked me. He had a shining scar on his temple and rose-colored lips. Have you seen him? She asked me. Or did you perhaps witness some demented person making his skin explode in piercing pain? Have you seen my son? She asked me, even if only for an instant. Have you seen my son? She said. Have you seen my son? She continued to ask. Yeah, between nine and 30,000 that are documented for people. People were rounded up just uh, by the military and the, most of them were young. So their mothers were, you know, left without the children. They're high school students or college students. Some were in trades, you know, unionists, labor. And uh, they just were disappeared. No record was kept of them. They were thrown out of airplanes after being tortured. 
It was a terrorizing of the whole country. They did by by just rounding up people, uh, who anyone who they would could call a leftist, and uh, torturing and killing them. Hey, so um, here's another one of the mothers walking around with portraits, pictures of their sons and daughters. Here are our albums. These are the photographs of their faces. Come closer. Do not be afraid. Isn't it true they're very young? She's my daughter. Look at this one. She's Andrea, and this one is my daughter, Paloma. She, we are the mothers of the disappeared. We collect their faces in these photographs, and we often talk with them and ask ourselves, who will caress Graciela's hair? What have they done with Andre's little body? Notice that they had names. They liked to read. They were very young. None of them ever got a chance to celebrate their 18th birthday. Here are their photographs, their immense albums. Come close, help me. Maybe you have seen him. When, when you travel, take one of these photographs with you. I wanna read a little, a little more hopeful note at the end of her book. She, she talks about mothers of the political prisoners. Mothers of political prisoners do not get hard hearted, nor do they carry in their faces traces and outlines of pain. Mothers, women of political prisoners carry victory bread when they approach the terrifying cracks of the void. And when they hand out bread, corn and sunshine, the prison fills up with birds and singing arms. Women of political prisoners don't cry when they bid farewell to their spouses condemned to death, to the recently tortured. They sing a hymn that resembles floods of deep rainbows of delight and they leave marching and between their skirts sprout children. And instead of fires and gravestone, they repeat themselves like rivers in life. And they don't seem anything like the furtive heels of death. Okay, just one more thing I wanna say from <laughs> Bertolt Brecht. This is one of my favorite poems at Vincent's College of Bertolt Brecht. Um, it was this spoken by uh, a writer who it's discovered that, and he looked at the list of all the books they were burning and said his book was, so his book wasn't on it. And so this is his, his little reply to that. Fair Brent, mein book, burn my book. Habe ich nicht immer die Wahrheit gerettet? Have I not always spoke the truth? Fair Brent Mick, burn me. <laughs> okay, thank you. Andy, thank you. Yes, I, I hope none of us needs to say that. Thank you. Okay, you. yeah. Wales, I'm wondering if we should um, play Colleen's song now or since we're running a little tight on time. Well, I'd say at least a minute or two of Colleen. Okay, all right. I will do that then. Um, Women won the vote in 1917 in a fight for restitution and equality. They put their bodies on the line. There's hunger strikes and picket sides. Dangerous women, yes, but a bittersweet victory. It's dangerous to stand alone. Dangerous to say your body is.
Now there are women whose wisdom knows no age, like Elizabeth Cady Stanton. While others retreated, they remained 